All right. Let's see. Am I am I on here? The green light's on. I should be good. Sweet. It's important for little people to have microphones. Otherwise, we just sound small. Um, okay. So a few things for you before we get started. Um, so I'm going to be um, uh, doing some work at another church over the next couple of weeks. Something's on. <laughs> um, uh, in Oswego, and so I'll be back the week of our business meeting. So if you're a church member and you have not received the letter for the church business meeting, please let me know, and I will put one in your hand today, and we'll get that uh, we'll get that taken care of. So there's some things we got to do uh, when it comes to that uh, time. Now, if you are not a member and you want to be part of that meeting, it's on the 5th, you're welcome to come. There's no secrets. There's no secret handshake. Well, I mean, there's a little a little blood sample, but that's, it's <laughs> no, no big deal, no big deal. We just sell your DNA to medical research facilities. So, um, you know, no, you're welcome to come. We, it's just talking about what we do as a church, how we do business, and so you're, you're welcome to be there as well. Um, so, every year, I have a theme for the year, and uh, next year is kind of different, and it requires your help if you're willing. So um, one of my favorite types of services to do is a Q&A service where we just kind of like whatever questions are on your mind, go and we try to answer them. Some of my answers are, I don't know, um, but we'll do the best we can. So next year, what I want to do is I need 40 people to tell me what you want to me to preach on. Could be a scripture verse, could be a topic. Could be something that you're just interest, interested in. You tell me what you would like to hear next year, and that's what we'll do. Um, we're going to have a guest speaker every month, so by the time you take out those 12, that's 40. So I need 40 ideas from you. Now, I can come up with stuff. Don't worry about that. That's, that's easy. Uh, but I want to give you the opportunity to ask questions. You know what? It would be really neat if you did a message on this. We'll give it a shot. We'll see what happens. Um, so all you have to do to submit those is write them on a piece of paper, drop them in the offering basket. That's it. You don't need a name or anything like that. No big deal. Um, and uh, it can even be something from a friend of yours. Or email it to me at office at riveroflifechurch.org. And we'll start compiling a list for next year, and we'll see what happens. I think it'll be a lot of fun, but I'm interested to see what you would like covered. What's on your mind? I always know what's on my mind, but what's on your mind? And we'll kind of look at it from that point. So you can start doing that at any time, um, and even you can even do it throughout next year. I, I think 40 is going to fill up kind of quick, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, all right, so over the last couple of weeks, we have been uh, briefly looking at some, some of the issues surrounding the role of the church in connection with the end times. One of the questions I got asked was, um, how come we haven't done like end timesy stuff? I'm thinking, end, what, what does end times he mean? Um, and basically, and uh, some of the questions I got asked was whether or not it was going to be, sorry, this is bugging me. Um, hey, that works better. Uh, every time I took a step, that monitor went boom. Uh, so I have to walk, so it's, it's important. Um, so the qu- one of the questions I got asked was, how come we haven't been dealing with some of the prophecies? And what about the the horses and the bulls and the, you know, and the, the, the dragon and and I want to come back to, it's, it's not an end time series. It's a series on the end times and the role of the church in the end times. So that's kind of where I've been trying to stay. Um, and in the first week, we talked about how as Christians, we've got to be really careful when we attach ourselves to an end times theory because they all have problems. It's impossible to say with, with 100% certainty, or <laughs> actually I think even 50% certainty, exactly what's going to happen in the end days. When it happens, we'll know. Other than that, cool, let's, uh, um, let's, just, let's talk about it, have fun with it, and kind of go from there. And last week we looked at some of the warnings regarding the inevitable falling away of the church, things that we know are going to happen, we just don't know when. As well as our responsibility towards understanding and recognizing false teachings within the church. And this week, I want to look at two passages of Scripture, and both are the words of Christ in regards to the end times and his directions towards us and what we can do, what is our part in this, this little scenario. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very easy to get caught up in the mystery of the end times because it's a lot of fun. If you've ever spent time talking to people about the end times, especially people who are really, really into it, it can be a lot of fun. There's, there's so many things. The Bible is so filled 
with word pictures of what this might look like or what may happen, um, it's, it's very easy to get caught up in that, you know? And as people, we like to think that we have it figured out. You know, anyone ever know, know one of those people that they always have to have everything figured out? They know exactly what's going to happen next? Yeah. Notice no hands went up? It's because no one wants to admit it. Um, but that's how we all are. We don't, none of us like to not know. But I think part of the reason why we were never given a clear explanation of exactly what's going to happen in the end times, because if we did, it wouldn't require faith. But because we only know bits and pieces, we have to trust that God has it under control, so it increases our faith. Now, the scriptures I want to look at today are Matthew 24, 32 and 39, and Luke 24, 48, 44 through 48, if you wanted to turn there or put a mark there. But as we're talking about the end days, one of the things we want to make sure is, is when we're, we're spending time exploring the heavenly, mis- heavenly mysteries, and honestly, I recommend that you do, look into it. It's, it's fun. Just remember to come back down to earth sometimes. You know, c- c- come back. You know, because we have things to do regarding those end times. Um, And let's just let God unfold it how he sees fit. I think that's the best way to do it. But one one of the things that I'd like you to think about is, in my opinion, one of the main reasons why God gives us so many bits and pieces about the end times is not that we would come up with a, a way to connect them all, but it's to keep it in the front of our mind that the end is going to come. You know, and sometimes we forget that. The end is going to come. It's not a matter of if. It's just simply a matter of when and what it's going to look like when it does happen. But the end will come. Whether we're ready for it or not. And that's the scary part. I think that's why we have to bolster our faith. Now, sadly, Scripture tells us that many will not be ready. If you think about the end times, for some, the return of Christ is going to be an absolute, complete, and total mystery. They're not even going to understand what's going on because they've never been explained the gospel message. They don't know anything about scripture. They don't know anything about what's going on. And it's a complete and total mystery. They've never had the opportunity to accept Christ. Now, I pray that God has mercy on those people, and I don't know how that judgment works. Uh, If they've never heard, how can you, how can you, how can you make a choice you've never been given? You know, so there's got to be mercy for that. I don't know what that looks like, but I'm going to leave that in the hands of God. Now, for other people, the return of Christ is going to be an absolute source of extreme fear and horror. And those are the people who know (laughs) that they should have been ready. You know those people, (laughs) you got those people in your life, they know, they've been taught, they've been told, but they don't believe. Or they say they believe, but the way they live lets you know that they don't, you know? There's a lot of things that we know to be true, but we don't believe that they're true. You know, there are certain types of food that we all know is exceptionally unhealthy for us. We eat it anyway, right? We all know that Twinkies are bad for you. And devil's food cake sends you straight to hell. (laughs) There's no redemption from that. I eat them both. Usually in... Excessive quantities, because that's just the way it works. Actually, my weakness is the Fritter Friday at Stewart's. (laughs) Preach it, brother! (laughs) But you go in in the morning, and they've done a horrible thing, a horrible thing. They've put them in the little pizza warmer. Some of you just figured that out. Like, I didn't know. Why didn't they tell me? You get there between six and seven, they're perfect, perfect. They're not so overcooked that they're dry, but they're just, they pull apart and the middle, the middle opens it up and you can actually hear it say, I love you. (laughs) All right, maybe it doesn't say that, but I hear that every time that I open it up and it's, it's horrible. It's not good for us, but what do we do? (laughs) Put the whole thing in our mouth before anyone notices. Because they're so good. (laughs) But there comes a point where when we do these things that we know are wrong and we do them anyway, there comes a point where we're we're caught. 
we are now stuck with the results of our own bad decision making, you know? And for Christians who don't want to believe in the writings of Scripture, there's going to come a point where the time of choice is over. And when we're dealing with the end times, that's something that, that I, I hope, if you walk away with a slogan, I hope this is it. There will come a point in time where the time of choice is over. There's no option. That's what the end times really signifies, where your ability to come to Christ no longer exists. It's done. The end is there, and now you're either in the boat or not. Now, there's another group of people that when Christ returns is going to be a source of extreme celebration. Extreme celebration. Because everything that we've hoped for, everything that we've placed our hope in, is now manifest in front of us. We get to see it and live it and walk it. We get to know that we know that we know. And all the times that people told us we were crazy or religious fanatics, all that crud is now turned to glory. And we get to see our Savior face to face. And these are all good conversations, and they're fun conversations. But we need to keep our mind on the mission. And the mission is Christ and him crucified and bringing that message to the world that's around us. So the first section of scripture I want to deal with is Matthew 24, 36 through 39. <coughs> and this is a fantastic portion of scripture. It says, but the day and the hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, but my father only. Now listen to this carefully. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving and given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now the days of Noah, if you think about that, well, one thing I want to point out before we move on um, one of the things you hear in the church today very commonly is that Genesis is just myth. Genesis is just allegory or metaphor. The problem is, here's Jesus talking about it like it's real history. There's a lot of modern day preachers who want to just poke at those things. Specifically, the account of creation, the global flood, and the ark of Noah. Jesus is talking about them like, oh, of course these are true. And we need to pay attention to that because that's going to come into play here in just a minute. The other thing I want you to, to, to think about is that young people today who have trouble with the Bible usually have, a trouble, have trouble with the Bible because they don't believe its history can be believed. Of course we came from monkeys. Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to be covering that at the beginning of next year, by the way. I will be starting the year with the creation series. Every two years I do that. Can the Bible's history be trusted? If you can't trust its history, how can you trust its promises? But Jesus says that just as in the days of Noah, so will be the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And this is an interesting reference because you may not have heard this before, but Noah in the Old Testament is referred to as a type of Christ. Uh, not Christ, and he's not like, you know, Jesus before Jesus. No, this, it, it's a type of Christ because this, the account of the history of Noah and his family follows the same kind of arc that the life of Christ follows, okay? It's, it's, it's a very similar process as it, as it goes through. Now, the basic idea here is that we can see a reflection of the purpose of Christ in the life of Noah and the account of Noah in the Bible. And I, I want to read you a little bit of this. This is Genesis 6, 1 through 9. It says, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. That's the first piece right there. That's not God telling you that you can only live to 120 years, 120 years old. It's not what he's saying. And, this, and we can tell because people lived longer than that after that. The flood was 120 years from this moment. That's what he's saying. The time of men will be 120 years. God's already planning the judgment, so we want to make sure we're reading this correctly. So in, uh, starting in verse 4, it says, um, there were giants on the earth in those days. 
And also afterward, when the sons of man came into the daughters of men and bore children to them, and those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every intent of their thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he, listen to this, the Lord was sorry that he had made man. He was sorry that he had made man. And he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I've even made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was just a man perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Noah walked with God. So how does this passage in Genesis attach to the end times? One of the key elements in the account of Noah is that he was a preacher of righteousness. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He talked about righteousness before God, and he talked about the coming judgment of God. <coughs> Excuse me. And that the ark that he was building was the only way to escape the judgment. And everyone laughed at him. They scoffed at him. They made fun of him. Fun of him. You're an idiot. You're going to spend 100 years building this boat? What is the matter with you? It's not even near the water. No one believed him. But here's why Noah's the type of Christ. Noah made the only way to escape the judgment that was coming. Did you hear that? Noah made the only way to escape the judgment that was coming. There was not two ways. And you were not going to survive it if you did not take the one way that was given. Now, most people know the story of Noah, that it was Noah and his, and his sons. So there were eight people on the ark altogether. But, you know, um, scientists have done a lot of work on the ark and the size. And if you've never been down to the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter down in, uh, down in Kentucky, you need to go because it's amazing. But one of the things that they noticed about the size of the ark is that the number of animals that they needed to keep on it in order to have all the animals that we see on earth today, the boat was too big. It was too big. To the point where Noah could have held a hundred or more additional people on the ark. Interesting, isn't it? It makes you wonder if before the door closed and the rain was falling, if he was standing there yelling, come, come, there's safety in here, there's judgment out there, you can, you can come with us. No one came. No one wanted to believe him. Now, if you think about this, on the appointed day, at the appointed time, a time that no one knew except God himself, God directed Noah into the ark. And here's a detail that a lot of people forget. Noah did not close the door. It was too big for him. God closed the door. It said God closed the door and sealed it behind them so that they would be protected. The moment God closed the door, there were only two types of people on the earth. Those in the boat and those not in the boat. And those not in the boat no longer had the option to get in. They no longer had the option to get in. The time of choice had come to an end. Today, especially in the progressive Christian mu uh, movement and the liberal church movements, there's a huge number of people that are under the impression that because God is good, he would never judge people the way the Bible says. And I, I, I have to laugh when I hear that. Because God is good, God would never judge us the way he said he was going to in the Bible, just trying to scare us so that we'll be good. Uh, no. I'm going to take God at his word. Why would, why, why would you roll those dice? Why would you play that game? But the way they look at it is that their God wouldn't do that. <coughs> My God would never do that. Well, what about the God? <laughs> what about the one and only true God? Would he? Because he said he was going to. And we know that God is good, but we also have to remember that God is just. And he cannot deny himself. 
Some even teach that everyone is going to go to heaven no matter what they've done. Call me crazy, but I don't think I'm going to see Hitler in heaven. <laughs> I'm just going out on a limb here, you know. They refuse to believe the writings of Scripture because they want to make God in their own image. The fact that so much of the church does not believe the seriousness of the final judgment shouldn't surprise anyone because we're told it was going to happen. We were told that this would happen, especially towards the end. 2 Peter 3, 3 through 6, it says this, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the, in the last days. <coughs> we know that we're in those. Walking according to their own lust, their own way of thinking. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Well, if Jesus is coming, boy, he's taking his time. And because he's taking his time, they take a break. And then he says this, for this, they willfully forget. And please pay attention to what they willfully forget. They willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water in the water, which means by his word, everything was created. By which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. Two things that people in the church are going to forget in the end days. They're going to willfully forget that God is our creator and he really did flood the whole earth. Two things they're going to willingly forget. Two things that we cannot ever let go of. That he is our creator and he is our judge. And he's serious about both. Well, God would never flood the earth again. You're right. He wouldn't. It's going to be a little different next time. <coughs> but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire. Fire. Until a day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So God is reminding us there is a judgment coming. And it will be the end times. The end will arrive. We don't know when, and we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but it is going to come, and just like the days of Noah, when it does, the choice for your family, your friends, your coworkers, your loved ones to make the choice to come to Christ is over. The option no longer exists. You're either in the boat or out of the boat. You either belong to Christ or you don't. But people willingly forget that God is serious about what he told us, which brings me back to the falling away from the authority of Scripture that we talked about last week. My personal feeling is that these people don't want to believe what has happened because if they believed what the Bible says about what has happened, then they're going to also have to believe what we're told will happen. See, if you don't believe one, you don't have to believe the other. That's not the way it works. Because we know what happened, we can trust in what's coming. And we should believe that leads me to my second piece of scripture, Luke 24, 48, 44 through 48. <coughs> Excuse me. Then he said to them, meaning Jesus, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they may comprehend the scriptures. Again, he's pointing us back to the authority of, of the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written and thus it was necessary for, uh, for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. Now listen to these next two verses. And that repentance and the remission of sin should be preached in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Remember last week when we talked about one of the beliefs taught by Bill Johnson was that Jesus didn't come to bring salvation. Salvation was just a secondary, necessary step to bring the real gift, which was the power of the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus loudly proclaiming he's wrong. Jesus gave us one mission, one mission alone, that repentance and the remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations. We are to be witnesses of that, of that. So when we're talking about the fun stuff, when we're talking about the, the end times and we get caught up in the bulls and the plagues and the pits, the great dragon and the four horsemen, 
Everyone loves that, you know. Makes me think of a wrestling group from the 80s. I don't know. Now I know who watched wrestling. Okay. We talk about the great statue with the clay feet and the horn that grows the other horns and the Antichrist and 666. Everyone wants to talk about 666. And a whole bunch of other things that were promised no one will ever truly understand until they happen. <coughs> While we're talking about all that fun stuff, let's remember that we have a job to do. That God is actually counting on us to do something very specific in his name. To bring repentance and the remission of sin to the nations. The reality that Christ can be forgiven by the grace of, that we can be forgiven by the grace of God through faith in the work of Christ on the cross is the message the entire world needs to hear over and 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 over again. Just in case you're wondering, they need to hear it a lot. Because just as in the days of Noah, there will come a point where we are no longer allowed to give that message. It makes no difference how good the person is. It makes no difference how much you loved them. It might makes no difference how much you cared about them. It makes no difference how much you meant to tell them. At that moment, at that point, it's done. They're either his or they're judged. Do you see how clear that line is? There is no gray area. When Jesus says, you're for me or against me, you're mine or you're not, he's, it, it's not, he's not kidding. But we're also told there's some amazing promises for those who are his. But think about this when Jesus is talking about the last days. Here's Matthew 25, 31, 32. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will be separated. He will separate them one, uh, one from the other as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. What is the difference between a sheep and a goat? A sheep is a believer, a goat is not. <coughs> and a goat can't pretend to be a sheep, a sheep can't pretend to be a goat. You can take that for whatever application you want, but you're either one or the other. How about Revelation 20, 11 through 15? It says, Then I saw a great white throne and, on hi uh, uh, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which, was, uh, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire which is also referred to as the second death. I wouldn't want that for anybody. For anybody. But he's serious about it. So how do we get our names written in the book of life? How do we get our friends' names written in the book of life and our, our relatives? It's Romans 10, 9. Romans 10, 9 and 11. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. See, we're back to one door, one way, one gate, and that's him. We follow after Christ and Christ alone. Salvation is a free gift of God given through the life of his son. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. But as far as free things go, this one's very expensive. <laughs> It's a free gift of God, but it'll cost you the rest of your life. The cost is pretty easily explained. <coughs> Let me ask you a question before I th show you this next piece of scripture. Did anyone here get saved by accident? You've never heard of Jesus. You've never heard of the Bible. You've never heard of the cross. Just suddenly, in your own mind, you decided you were going to believe on someone named Jesus. You're going to believe on something called the cross, and you're going to believe that that was going to take away all of your sins. That ever happened to anybody? Okay, good. Just checking. Just checking. Someone had to tell you, right? Someone had to bring the message to you. How about this? How then can they call on him when they have, they have not believed? And how can they believe on him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet 
of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings and good things. You see, the gift is free, but what it costs us is the rest of our life. We are to take this message to the nations. We are to take this message to work. We are to take this message to Little League. We are to take this message to football practice. And your kids are to take this message to school. And they're to take this message to the Cub Scouts or the Girl Scouts or whatever. We are to take the message everywhere we go. Whether people want to hear it or not. Be tactful, though. No gospel sex guns, okay? <coughs> Listen to these two promises. 1 John 3, 1 through 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called his children, the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, we are now children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Revelation 21, 1 through 7. Now I see a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. You know, God's going to rebuild this whole thing. We get to go back to the beginning and see how things were supposed to be if we, if we hang on. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his, uh, shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no sorrow, or nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes, he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God. He shall be my son. He who overcomes. You want to get excited about the end times? Then I say do it. But let's do it in the right way. Let's get excited that we have been given something. That has been made available to us. Now, while I was preparing for this, I was uh, uh, I was listening to a, a really old album um, by an old mentor of mine, Kathy. You're going to recognize this song. And uh, a song came up. He didn't write it. His name was Tim Grant. He didn't write it. This song was written by Phillips Craig and Dean, and uh, it's just a lot of fun. Hopefully, this stayed in tune. I'm going to be shutting my uh, ear-worn mic off, and I'll be moving to this one. Let's see. And it made me think about this particular message. That's a subtle sound check. All right, so just going to slam my guitar into that. All right. Okay, so this song is called His Favorite Song of All. Some of you may recognize it. I actually didn't know who wrote it until I started looking for the lyrics uh, a couple days ago. <laughs> Um, I, I was just knew it the way Tim had done it, and I listened to the way Phillips, Craig, and Dean did it, and I went, oh, that's not how I remember that song. Um, so if this is not the way you remember it, if you've ever heard it, it's okay. Give me some forgiveness, and we'll be, we'll be good. Um, but I'd like you to think about the lyrics. <coughs> Excuse me, if I can get through this without choking. I want you to think about the lyrics, and uh, when I hear this song, it makes me think about the mind of God, 
and the heart of God. And it also makes me think about the end days and how many people are going to be involved in this sound. Okay? So. Well, he loves to hear the wind sing as he whistles through the pines on the mountain peaks. And he loves to hear the raindrops as they splash through the ground in a magic melody. He smiles in sweet approval as the waves crash to the rocks in their harmony. Creation joins in unity to sing to him majestic symphony. But his favorite song of all is the song of the redeemed. When lost sinners now make believe, lift their voices loud and strong. When those purchased by his blood lift to him a song of love. Nothing more he'd rather hear, no so pleasing to his ear than his favorite song of all. Well, he loves to hear the angels as they sing, Holy, holy is the land. Heaven's choirs in harmony lift up praises to the great I am. But he lifts his hands for silence when the weakest saved by grace begins to sing. And a million angels listen as a newborn soul sings, I've been redeemed. Cause his favorite song of all is a song of the redeemed. When lost sinners now made to me Lift their voices loud and strong When those purchased by his blood Lift to him a song of love Nothing more he'd rather hear No so pleasing to his ear As his favorite song of all Not just melodies and harmonies that catches his attention. Not just clever lines and phrases causes him to stop and listen. But when any heart set free, washed and bought by Calvary, begins to sing. It's his favorite song of all. It's the song of the redeemed. When the lost sinners now made to me Lift their voices loud and strong When those purchased by his blood Lift to him a song of love Nothing more he'd rather hear No so pleasing to his ear Than his favorite song of all Nothing more he'd rather hear, no so pleasing to his ear, than his favorite song of all. <laughs> so I'm a preacher, so I naturally want to keep going, but I'm not gonna, because I've kept you guys late for the last couple of weeks. <laughs> Yay, we get to go! I hope, you, I hope seriously that you think about it. Because the end times, like I mentioned before, is a lot of fun. But if we don't come back to the reality that they should be a reminder of the job we're here to do, then I think we lose the focus. And we get sidetracked on trivia instead of pinned to what matters. So I pray that God keeps our thoughts in the heavens and our actions firmly grounded on earth so that we may send people to him as often as we can.
Because just as in the days of Noah, there will come a time when the only people left on earth are the judged. And I don't want anyone I know, and I don't want anyone you know to be in that group. So we got work to do. Amen. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have. Every day we wake up is another opportunity to reach someone for you, to bring somebody else into glory. Help us to be wise in our words, in our actions, in our temperament, in our language, in our joking, that it all be usable and useful to bring people back to you. Don't let us stand before you later in life, Lord, seeing all the missed opportunities we had to bring people to you. Let us seize those opportunities here on this earth. Let us take up our role in your mission, and let us take it up with a degree of seriousness and commitment. We thank you that you allow us to be part of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord bless you. Be seated. I know.